On today's video, I have something of a list that I want to go over. This list, its contents might be unique to me, but if you're watching this, if you have cameras, if you've collected cameras, if you want to get into cameras, you might have a similar list. And that is, of course, the list of perfect cameras. And what I mean by perfect cameras, I mean cameras that at any point in time I was looking at, I was like, I need to have that. That's going to make my life better. That's going to make my photos better. Some of these cameras I have bought, I have used, I have thoughts on others. I have not, but I still have thoughts on. I want to go through it chronologically, talk about my experiences with them, talk about my thoughts as to why they're on the list. And hopefully this just be a fun little exercise. We can just chat for a little bit about some cameras. So to begin the list, we'll start with the Pentax ME Super. This is on here primarily because I started off with the Pentax K1000. So I was already kind of in that K mount series of cameras. I was working on them as well at the time and I really enjoyed working on them. So that filled me with confidence that if I was to get one, if it wasn't to work, I know how to fix it. Easy to use camera. It's got a nice auto feature, has a decent advance, has a nice shutter sound. All of these little things were kind of checking boxes for me. So I ended up getting one 30 bucks with a 50 millimeter 1.4. I've owned many of them since that point in time, but they're really reliable, great cameras. I recommend them to just about anybody getting into film photography. I think the ME Supers are a great beginning point. It's definitely a system that you can grow with and continue to use, even if you are to take this to a professional level. Next up is uh, the Pentax Super Program. And <laughs> this one doesn't really make sense as to why it's on here, um, but I'll explain it anyway. The Super Program, if you don't know, is pretty much just a beefed up version of the ME Super. There's some like quality of life changes, but for the most part, it's the same camera. It has two LCD screens on it. One of them is on like the outside, so you can see what shutter speed you're shooting at, which is kind of cool. Beyond that, I really put it on here because in Japan and Europe, they were sold as Super A. And on the black Super A bodies, I just thought those looked cool. And that was kind of the entire reason that I wanted one. I guess kind of understanding it was the exact same thing as an Emmy Super, but a little bit different. I ended up getting a Program Plus, which is a lesser version of the Super Program and only has the LCD and the viewfinder with no rear light to expose it properly. So it's kind of reliant on exterior light, like the sun or a street light or something in order to see what shutter speed you're shooting at. Top of that too, it caps out at one 1,000th of a second, which is slower than the ME Super. So it was really a downgrade and I've not really thought about them too much since then, but there was a little bit of humility anytime I think like, oh, I, I know so much about film cameras. I remind myself of that, that moment in time, just if I need to be humbled. Moving on to the next camera, we have the Canon QL17 G3. In my defense, when I was looking into this camera, it was in that span of time that the poor man's Leica M6 moniker was coming about. Leica has a very high name value to it. Brand recognition is very high there. The Canon QL17 G3 is a fine camera. Outside of the fact that it's a rangefinder, it shares very little in common with a Leica system. The poor man's Leica moniker never really worked for me. I was just interested in kind of seeing what a rangefinder would be like. Again, it's small, it's compact, it has a pretty fast lens. I thought that'd be cool. Ended up getting one Craigslist, drove all the way up to like way north Phoenix, bought it from a guy who was like obsessed with his Sony digital Mavica. He was like trying to get me to buy both of them. The moment that will live in infamy in my mind is him trying to like sell me on how great this digital camera is and me just being like, that's cool. I'll just take the, the Canonette. Now I have a Sony digital Mavica and like eight floppy disks to my name. Canonets are one of those cameras that I've bought a lot of in my lifetime. I enjoy working on them. I think the construction of them is pretty solid. It's just not a camera that really ever clicked with me. I never really like jumped off the page and never wowed me in the way that other cameras have. So it's not one that I've really hung on to all that much. But at the time, like I said, it was something I was like, I gotta have it. And then the reality was it was okay. The next one on the list, and this is actually going to be the first that I have not owned or really shot with too much, the Contax G1. Now the G1 is on this list strictly because I watched a video where someone was shooting with it. And the high paced frenetic energy 
of the video and the photos that were taken. It was so enticing. It sold me on this idea because I want to take pictures like that, like just these fun, fast paced, energetic images. I was like, that's great. I want that. So I looked into them and I was looking into them for quite a bit of time. Realized that the most affordable lens option for them was like the 90 millimeter, which was not really something I was looking for at the time. Kind of going down the rabbit hole a little bit more, realizing that the G1 and G2 have a whole host of electrical issues that are not even worth trying to get fixed. I kind of passed on that after that point because I'm not trying to invest in a future paperweight. I want to get a camera that works, which is also kind of the reason I never got into like the Contax T2. I never really got too much into the point and shoot phase. I've always been more of an SLR guy. I count myself kind of lucky for that, but every now and again, I'll, I'll dance with the devil in my mind. I'm like, oh, G1 would be kind of fun, be kind of cool. I just thought they'd look cool. I think they still kind of look cool. Next up, Hustle. Blood X Pan. I feel like this one's probably on everyone's list. Very obvious choice of like a, a camera that you have to have. It's like up there with people's Mamiya 7s. That's another one that everybody really wants one. The Hasselblad x Pan's kind of up there for me, but not so much lately because the initial thought, the initial appeal was the panoramic feature. That's cool. Like I like taking landscapes. I could like take some cool landscapes with that. But I think what really sold me on not wanting one long-term was I couldn't find any other reasons past that. Like I couldn't figure out how that would make my photography any better, how that would make me a better photographer past it'd be cool. I could take a cool photo. There wasn't a whole lot of planning or development past that point. When you're kind of confronted with the reality of this is going to be, for most people, a life-changing sum of money to afford, then coupling that with the idea that I can't really come up with anything more than it'd be cool as a reason to buy one or to start saving for one. Moving on to the next item on the list, we have the Pentax 6.7, a camera that, again, kind of hit a brief stint of heightened popularity. I bought into it right before that big jump, and it was a camera that I really enjoyed for quite a bit of time. I got it because I was thinking 6.7 is gonna be great, and I started shooting medium format, only 6.6, and I kind of wanted to change it up. I looked into 6.45 for a little bit because I was like, oh, I can get more out of the roll. But the only options I was really seeing were, especially in my price range, were like the Mamiya 645 and the Pentax 645. And I didn't really like the idea of holding a box. So I looked into the Pentax 67. A buddy of mine also talked me into it. But I got one and I really liked it. And I know there is a difference, okay, between 67 and 66. I get that. But like, Is it worth losing two more shots on the roll for? I don't think so, personally. I like the square format. I think it looks cool. A bit of a controversial opinion for some, but I've had no issues with it. So yeah, the 6.7 for me just like didn't really scratch an itch. It does also kind of limit itself to being the only camera you can bring with you because it is so big and bulky, which given the fact that most places I go, to take photos, like I'm also trying to do a video, I'm gonna try to do a bunch of different things. So by that nature, I have other cameras. It makes it a little bit harder to have all of those cameras and then also the giant 6.7. So I find it limiting in that regard, but it is a camera that I enjoy. I have probably enough parts to make a full one. So I'll probably do that at some stage and revisit it, but for the time being, we'll see. It was a, it's a good camera. I don't really have much else to say past that point. It was a very quick uh, fixation that I had, but it definitely was a present one, I would say. Moving on to the Nikon F3. This is kind of where we hit a bit of a pinnacle in terms of what film cameras have to offer. I think this is probably one of the best film cameras ever made. It is incredibly solid. I remember distinctly the first time I advanced one and felt that smooth ball bearing advance. And I was like, I need to have one of these in my life. So I got one and I will say that it has delivered on its quality, on its reliability, on its durability. It is just delivered. I feel like it might've made me a better photographer, but it definitely makes me enjoy the process of taking a photo all that much more. I've taken like some very poignant memories 
with the Nikon F3 that I own. So it's definitely gonna be one that I never get rid of, never move on from. It's gonna be one that I hold on to forever because of those reasons. I just really enjoy it. I have nothing but positive things to say about the system overall. Out of all of the ones on the list, the F3 and the Ami Super probably are two that I feel like really delivered on the status that I gave them by virtue of putting them on this list. The idea behind having this like perfect camera is you're kind of like putting it up on a pedestal to some degree, thinking like, this is going to do X, Y, Z. Pentax Emmy Super and the F3, by virtue of how long I've shot with them, by virtue of what I've been able to do with them, I feel like have delivered on those fronts. Brings us to the next one, which is a camera that did not deliver on those fronts, and that would be the Contax S2. Seasoned viewers of this channel will know how I feel about this camera. It's not my favorite. The reason I got it to begin with is because I was looking for a mechanical SLR system, but I wanted to be a bit classier, a little nicer. I wanted to take a moment to treat myself because even unseasoned viewers will know I'm a bit of a trash monster, okay? Four parts repair on eBay, price ascending on KEH. I've even bought in lots of broken cameras from Goodwill. I've bought in things from Goodwill that they just measure in poundage, not even in how many. They can't even be bothered to count the amount of garbage they're sending you. They just like slop it on a scale, put it in a box and kick it down the stairs to you. That's the kind of stuff that I've bought. That's the kind of stuff that I own. So I was looking at all of these cameras out there and I was like, I'm not a Leica person. The Canonet QL17 G3 didn't really serve as the gateway drug for me to get down the rangefinder rabbit hole. So I still want an SLR. I wanted to be mechanical. For a moment I was like, oh, is the ON3, is that potentially one? And then I kind of moved on from that very quickly. And then I saw the Contax S2. And there was something about that, the gold finish on it, the titanium top and bottom plates that just really screamed quality. And I thought, listen, Treat yourself. So I, I, I thought I would. I ended up getting it, I shot with it, I took some good photos with it. I enjoyed the experience for the most part. When the shutter failed, and I had to take the whole thing apart, clean it and all this stuff and get it working again. I was thinking back and I was like, it has not done anything that a K1000 couldn't do. Like yes, of course, the S2 can shoot up to 1 4,000th of a second shutter speed, whatever. So can an FM2 though. And I think an FM2 is a much nicer camera. And I think that the Nikon glass is probably better than some of the Contax Yashica mount glass that I was shooting with at least. I know that the Zeiss lenses are Contax lenses as well. <laughs> oh man. When people get into the weeds about lenses and stuff, my brain just checks out. So I'm not really gonna get too far into that. All I want it to be said is that, in my mind, there's a very small amount of people that can look at an image and attribute any of the qualities of that image to a specific lens set. And those aren't really people that I wanna spend time with. I think like there's a difference between if you take a picture with the lens you like and you're able to point out why it is you like it, that's fine. But if someone's like critiquing your work and the reason they're critiquing it is because you're using an affordable lens, Shut up, dude. <laughs> what are we doing here? Looking fun police, go keep your badge, dude. Ugh. <laughs> Get a lens that works, basically. I think the Nikon glass is really great. I think it's much more affordable than Contax, Yashica mount stuff. And then also with the K1000, I've taken great photos with the K1000. It's an all mechanical, reliable, durable SLR. Sure, it doesn't have the titanium top and bottom. It doesn't have the gold finish. It doesn't have the 60 year anniversary on it. Who cares? I think that it's a great camera. I ended up moving on from the S2, sold it, we're good. Made another video about it, it's pretty good. The final camera on this list of great cameras. This, is, this camera is the last one, not because of the chronological order in which I've thought about it, because I've been thinking about this camera since pre-X-Pan, but just because it, this is like the camera equivalent to my white whale, okay? And that is the Hasselblad SWC. Before we crack into this, this is another camera that I feel like a lot of people really want for one reason or another. The reason I want it, and the reason why I'll probably never have it, are two things that kind of coincide. And it kind of goes back to another point of this whole process, thinking about cameras like this, discussing them, all of these things. So why I want it, 
It's because I like wide angle photography. I like 6x6, it has both of those things. It's a small compact system, easy enough to use. You're limited to the one lens set, which I kind of like, and overall produces pretty quality images if you know how to use it, and unique images as well. So there's that. The other reason that I kind of want is because I can imagine a lot of ways in which I would use it, a lot of ways in which it would develop the photos I'm taking, a lot of the ways in which it would enhance my photographic capabilities. It would create a more unique experience. And I feel like those are very solid foundational reasons to invest in a system as opposed to, I like it, it look pretty, which is the reason why I've bought a lot of the things on this list, but that's okay. That's, listen, live and learn. Other reason as to why I probably will never have it is because I don't think that I need it as much as I want it, okay? So there's a want and a need. I would love one, but I don't need one to live. I'm very happy with the cameras I have. I'm happy with my Bronica with the 50 millimeter lens. It's wide enough. I think it's cool enough. It has unique aesthetics to it. And it's not an SWC, it's my own thing. Like it's something that I worked on that I've kind of been perfecting how to use over time. I understand it. And I'm not buying into the top of the line thing. I kind of have my own little garbage pail kid version of the SWC. I like that. It feels a little bit more authentic to me, the photographer, creator, what have you. The thing though I think is most important about this practice generally is being able to look at your work, look at your ability to create things, not as a stagnant thing, but as something that you can add value sets to. Looking at photography, looking at videography, looking at any of these things that you do, that you invest your time and that you invest your effort and your money into as something that you can continue to work on, continue to build off of, and finding the value sets that you identify as important within your work and developing on those by virtue of the tools that you use, the way that you look at images, the way that you look at taking images. That is what I think is most important about this practice. That's why I wanted to talk about these things and share with you. Because initially for me, this list started out as things I could repair, things I thought looked cool, things I thought would be interesting, and now getting up to the point where things that could potentially increase my ability to take high quality images, but also having a full, wherewithal to know that I also have an entire list of things that I thought at some stage would increase my images, my image quality, and might have to some degree not enough to validate the expenditure of getting those systems. It's a very important talk to have with yourself. There's the joke of the gear accrual syndrome. I will argue that a lot of the cameras I own, I own because I need parts for repair. So that's my little <laughs> exemption notice there. But at the end of the day, I fall victim to it too. I think cameras look cool, but I don't want to fall down that rabbit hole of what's next after the SWC? What's next after that? What's next after that? Continually trying to fill a void within yourself that can only be filled by yourself. Not by buying new stuff, not by piling more crap on top of it. It has to be a conversation, an inner dialogue that you have figuring out what it is you actually want, how it is you actually want to go about doing things, and then finding actionable steps to do those things. It's not always going to be buying something. Sometimes it might be, but that shouldn't be where we immediately resort to. Gotta buy it, gotta buy it, gotta buy it. No, take a breath, take a moment. Why? Why do you have to buy it? And if you can answer that, and an answer that you feel is satisfactory, then by all means. But if it's just gotta buy it because I gotta buy it, maybe you don't. Maybe you don't. That is my list of perfect cameras. I would love to hear what cameras are on your list. If you agree with any of mine, if you think my list is terrible, which at times I definitely think it is, feel free to share that in the comment section down below. Share your cameras as well. Maybe I'll do another video kind of going over people's lists, letting them know what I think about it, if you value my opinion at all. Regardless, I hope you enjoyed the discussion. I hope you enjoyed the video. Like it if you did, subscribe to the channel, and uh, catch you on the next one.